I'm here um, to speak to you about male pattern violence, trauma arising from male pattern violence and how it impacts upon the brain and what that means for trauma-informed practice. Um, as Betty said, I have worked with vulnerable families, women and children for over 15 years um, and this is an area of passion for me. Um, I've studied psychology, trauma and I'm in the current master's student in domestic and family violence practice. I just wanted to start by telling you a story. So there was a man who studied human psychology at a long time ago and he was really good at it too. And what he did, he embarked on a project where he spoke to women and girls, mostly from the upper class because they were the only ones that could afford that kind of intervention. They were demonstrating some really significant presentations and presentations that we would recognise today as trauma responses. And when it got down to it, he had intense and repeated and regular discussions with these women and girls. And what he found was that these trauma presentations were arising from sexual abuse, sexual exploitation and victimisation. It was like, wow, this is really amazing. He wrote a paper and he presented it, he got it published. Um, I'm sure he was really excited about what could happen to help women and girls and everyone in our in community to address this massive issue that was impacting on people so badly. What happened was the exact opposite. He just got slammed. Um, I read about this in Judith Herman's book, Trauma and Recovery, and it's still a massive controversy today how this all came about. There was just universal and cold, stony silence to his findings. So his only allies had he asked or thought about were in the feminist movement. However, he was quite a traditional man and he didn't want to go there. So instead he buried that research and he basically discredited his research participants and never spoke of it again. And he started then proposing different theses for different things, things that psychology students still learn about today. That theory that was slammed was the etiology of hysteria by Sigmund Freud in 1899. So as Susan Faludi mentioned in the 80s, I think, or late 70s, backlash against women's rights and listening to women has occurred throughout history. And Sigmund Freud's example is just one of many. And I consider that what's happening right now is simply just the same script with a different take. So what is male pattern violence? Male pattern violence was described by Ruby in about 2004 to talk about like most violent actions in our community and our society across different cultures is perpetrated by males, people of the male sex. So there's that but it's also indelibly linked to the male socialisation and hegemonic masculinity within our society. So being aggressive, being competitive, being sexually entitled to the bodies of women. And all of these things play out in different avenues that like pornography and prostitution, domestic and family violence, obviously. So when male pattern violence um, is studied, by the ABS, they do the personal safety study each four years. So ANROSE, which is the Australian National Research Organisation for Women's Safety, looked at um, the PSS from 2012 and published their findings in 2016. And what they found is not very much different to what is found across the globe, is that most, ma most violence is committed by males. Most males, um, most victims of physical assault are males, but they are often assaulted in public settings by strangers. Most sexual assault victims are female, and all of, regardless of physical or sexual, the perpetrators are generally male. And that's, that holds up across cultures, as I mentioned before. So within our community, we have, it is estimated, one in five women have had an experience of sexual violence since the age of 15 compared to one in 22 males. So that's a significant difference in perpetration. And there's, at the end of the day, there are men out there that are actually committing those crimes. So when, what happens when a person experiences trauma? PSS has found that women can be fearful for up to 12 months after one specific event of violence. 
So what happens then for women who have, because if people have been victimised in the past, particularly people who have been victimised as a child, they are, they are at increased vulnerability for violence in the future. They've found PSS data and reported by ANROS found that for over 50% over of women who have been sexually assaulted once will be sexually assaulted again or have experienced multiple victimisation episodes. The brain. So I think it's Bruce Perry talks about the brain like that. So this is the base of your brain where heart rate, blood pressure, um, all the basic things to keep your system running are down here. The brain develops from the bottom up and from the inside out. So this is the front of your brain that is in charge of all of your executive functioning, the higher order thinking. In here is the thalamus, the amygdala and the limbic system. And what the limbic system does is it obtains information from the outside world and assesses it for danger and risk. So the amygdala is on the fast track to your senses and the amygdala is constantly scanning. For a child or person who has a stable, secure, worry-free time, the amygdala is kind of just cruisy. If it's not, the amygdala is on high alert. So when they say that women who have experienced violence are fearful for up to 12 months, that's saying that the amygdala and the stress response system is still vigilant for danger. So, um, and then we talk about this with children a lot. When your amygdala is activated, you flip your lid. Your amygdala is on guard, it's doing everything and all the higher order functioning, your rationality, it's not there anymore. It's not possible to talk someone down if they are dysregulated. De-escalating without calming the amygdala cannot happen. So how does it happen? It happens by providing safety, security and stability. Providing predictability and routine so that the amygdala and the cortisol levels are able to come down and you're able to re-engage your higher order thinking. So when women have all girls or anyone, their amygdala is activated and they are fearful and in terror, they might flee, fight or fright or fawn. One way to calm that down is to then provide a safe area so that those things can come back online, the rationality can come back online. Services for women by women have always known this without, I guess, the benefits of decades of trauma research. There's been fits and starts in trauma research as well as women's rights. But what has happened is that women's services and DV shelters and rape crisis centres have always known that in order to calm the amygdala and bring things back to a base is to provide an environment without possible re-traumatisation and re-victimisation. And one of the ways that that's possible is to provide an environment where there is no possible triggers. And one of those ways is without males present. And women have done that without being told, without the benefits of Bruce Perry of Bessel van der Kolk, without all that research backing it up. But that's what we know now. So imagine if Sigmund Freud had have stuck to his guns. Imagine if working to ensure re-victimisation, re-traumatisation, imagine if we made that the, the, our highest priority for everyone. Rather than um, ignoring research and ignoring what women have intrinsically known, imagine if people listened to the stories of women and listened the way Freud did do, but failed to follow through. Thank you.